Blessings, friends, brothers, and sisters. We're still studying Christ as our righteousness in the context of the third angel's message of righteousness by faith. It's by far the sweetest message in the whole wide world. It is the best message. And as we've been saying, it is the message to prepare God's people for Jesus Christ to come back. Now, we haven't really made much mention of even Revelation chapter 14. And that will come with much relentless force. But we're zeroing in on the individual whom it's all about, Jesus Christ. And we're zeroing in on him because when we understand who he is and grasp where he comes from and what he went through, then we can appreciate what the Bible calls the faith of Jesus. In Revelation 14 and verse 12, the Bible says, Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, all of that means nothing unless Christ is thoroughly comprehended. Christ, who he was, and his position. Because when that's properly understood and appreciated and accepted then we can understand what it means for us to have the faith of Jesus Christ, what we can expect to happen in us when we have the faith of Jesus Christ. In other words, Christ is the foundation. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11, For no other foundation can any man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation. We've been talking about his divinity and his humanity, which is the display of God's self-sacrificing love, his selfless love for the human family. And in looking at how he actually became a man like us, and we're going to keep on looking at that even more, the humanity of Christ, then we see how much he went through in order to overcome for us so that we may have that faith. When we understand what he went through, then we understand the potency of that thing which is called the faith of Jesus. So typically, uh, the, the, the general traditional way is to go through righteousness is this, and faith is this, and we have righteousness by faith, by this. But we're going to look at Jesus first, and in looking at faith in action, seeing it working out in a man, then their appreciation will be much higher. The joy will be much higher. The expectancy that will be in our heart will be much greater than the theory of you'll have the righteousness of God. No, we need to see what that righteousness actually does. And that is why we've been laying and we continue to lay the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. There's a wonderful book called Testimonies to the Church, volume five. On page 725, it says, The foundation of Christianity is Christ, our righteousness. Christ, your righteousness. Christ, my righteousness. This is something I could talk about for years. Something that we should all be able to just bask in and just appreciate and just consider continually to know that Christ is our righteousness. You know, Christ is God's righteousness, don't you? Yes, Christ is God's righteousness. God, creator of heaven and earth. God, the sovereign of the whole universe. Christ is God's righteousness. And Christ is also our righteousness. Not the righteousness of angels. Not the righteousness of the unfallen worlds. No, he is not even the righteousness of sinless Adam. When Adam was created, the Bible says he was very good, and Christ was not his righteousness as he is our righteousness, the righteousness of sinful man. Christ is my righteousness. Me, a sinner, 
a weak, debilitated sinner. One with much bad equipment and lusts. Christ is my righteousness. Christ is my strength and your strength too. And we need to learn to see him just as that. As our strength in the time of need. In the present moment. Christ is our strength. He's our everything, you see. He is all the world to us. And so we're going to keep on studying Christ as our righteousness. The righteousness of sinful man. Because that's where the gospel is really amazing. The fact that Christ is the righteousness of sinful of a sinner. Not of a righteous man. That's not amazing. A righteous man, a good man. Or, 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 or a sinless creature. That's not amazing that he, he does righteously. But what's amazing is that a sinner, you know the thoughts that's in your mind. You know what your flesh lusts after. But Christ is our righteousness. We're going we're gonna to unfold that even more for the mind that may not have grasped it all. By the grace of God, it will lead us to lifelong surrender to God's love. The last thing I'll mention before we pray is that the righteousness of Christ is the fruit of a lifelong conflict, even unto death, yea, even the death of the cross. And you know what? He won. On the cross of Calvary, Christ won the battle. That righteousness was a righteousness that was contending. It was the fruit of a lifelong conflict against a sinful nature. And he overcame it. He overcame it by the power of God. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Oh Lord, we want to thank you for the righteousness of Christ. And that Christ is our righteousness. Lord, he is our righteousness for us. He actually became one of us to give to us strength and power in becoming partakers of the divine nature, to overcome sin, to be filled with your spirit, and to glorify you in this world. Oh Lord, so many of us need strength. We are weak. We are incapable we are sick and tired of being sick and tired and sick and tired of hearing that same old motto of being sick and tired. Lord, we ask that you may give us a fresh new look at Christ, our righteousness, even now as we get into the study of your word. Oh Lord, we come to your word with anticipation, expecting much from you. And so, Lord, we ask that you may cleanse our hearts of all sin and guilt and our filthiness. Cleanse us, Father, for we are no good, but your Spirit has done a work in us which has led us to want to study your Word even now. Open our hearts, open our minds, and transform us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Christ is our righteousness. The righteousness of the human family. Let's turn our Bibles to the Gospel of Leviticus. Let's turn to the Gospel of Leviticus chapter 25. We're going to see something magnificent there. And we're in the Gospel of Leviticus. That's part of the Pentateuch part of the first five books of the Bible, Leviticus chapter 25. We're going to read from verse 25 to 27. And the Bible says, If thy brother be waxen poor, and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin, any of his kin, come to redeem, bless God, 
it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it, and he himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof, and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. Now, we notice that word kin. Kin is kin means family member, a relative, someone that is a close family relative. That's what kin is. And here we just read in the Gospel of Leviticus that, that, that if a man had possession and he lost it to someone who he was in debt to, so he just gave up that possession, right? If he wanted to redeem it, if he could redeem it, then he could redeem it with whatever funds he may have. But if he couldn't do it, yet he still wanted it to be redeemed. Then one of his kin, one of his kinsmen, right? One of his family members, and it had to be a family member, could redeem his lost inheritance. One of his family members could buy back that which he has lost. Now, I know that some of you are already excited. Because you see that word redeem. And when we think redeem, we just think of that, that uh, hymn that says, Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We're going to come to that. So we see that if someone lost their inheritance to someone who they were in debt to, they can buy it back if they could afford it. But if they couldn't afford it, then one of their family members could redeem it. All right, now let's go to verse uh, 47. Let's go to verse 47. Verse 47, the Bible says, If a sojourner or a stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him or any that is nigh of kin. Any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him. Or if he be able, he may redeem himself. Now, here we saw a different application to the same principle that if something is sold off, and this is specifically speaking about the man, if the man can't afford to pay back someone who he's in debt to, then he, in that time, they would sometimes give themselves as slaves. They would give themselves as bondmen to work for that individual who they are in debt to. And in order for them to no longer be a slave, in order for them to no longer be in bondage, they would need to be redeemed. Amen. They would need to be redeemed. And the only one that could redeem them if they cannot redeem themselves is their kinsman, is a close family member. Because it said someone that is nigh right? Someone that is, that's in verse 48, nigh of kin, meaning near of kin. And that person has to be the nearest of kin, not just near of kin, but actually they had to be the nearest of kin, the nearest family relation. And we know that that is so, we could find that in the book of Ruth. Remember the story of Ruth, right? We had Naomi who lost some possessions, some of her possessions. And, um, Ruth went to stay with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and Naomi wanted to be able to get her possession back, right? But the only way that she can get her possession back is if she received it, is if it was bought back by someone who was nearest of kin. And Boaz was interested in Ruth, and Boaz was willing to marry Ruth, and in marrying Ruth, he would be able to redeem what Naomi had lost. All right, he will be able to redeem what Naomi had lost. 
But there was someone in the way, so Boaz went and had a conversation with him. The guy said, hey, I'm not interested. I don't want to have any more problems in my family. You could have her. And Boaz made a promise, and he went out, and he got uh, Ruth. And then he became nearest of kin. And he was able to restore, he was able to redeem what Naomi had lost. And that's the same story that we've been studying from the book of Hebrews chapter 2. And also in the book of Genesis chapter 1, we found that there was a man and his name was Adam. And Adam had an inheritance and that was the world. And Adam, unfortunately, he sold out the whole entire world. And he also sold out the whole human race in bondage. So he sold out his inheritance, the world, to Satan. And he sold out the the human race in bondage. And the only way that mankind could be redeemed was if someone was nearest of kin to mankind and was willing to buy them back. Did you see that? The only way that man could be bought back, because we saw in the Gospel of Leviticus that if you uh, lost your inheritance because you were because you couldn't afford it or you just lost it, or if you um, um, uh, sold yourself off and, and you wanted to no longer be a slave, then you would need someone who's nearest of kin to buy you back to redeem you. And man was in that same exact position where man had lost the world and had lost himself. And so man needed someone who was nearest of kin in order for man to be redeemed. And in order for man to be redeemed, there was one who actually became nearest of kin. Do you see it now? There was actually one who actually became nearest of kin with mankind in order to buy them back. And he bought them back at a very expensive price. Yea, even the price of his life. I'm talking about the life of the Son of God. His name is Jesus Christ, our righteousness. And he bought man back. He became nearest of kin, nearest in blood relationship with you and with me, with all of mankind. Jesus Christ did just that, and we saw that in the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Let's turn there again. We believe in repetition, right? Hebrews chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 14, which we see that Christ became nearest of kin, even in blood relationship with mankind. And that's how close God became with man. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, the Bible says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Flesh and what? Flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So here we find Christ, God with us, God as us, God in the flesh, and God in our blood. God in flesh and blood, Jesus Christ, he did that in order to redeem us, in order to buy us back, and in order to restore to us what we had lost, that lost inheritance. Hebrews 2 and verse um, verse 5, where the Bible says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. So the world to come is the inheritance that we had lost. The world to come, whereof we speak, he gave it back to man, and that man was Jesus Christ. Christ bought back the inheritance and Christ bought back mankind so that we may live again, so that we may enjoy his righteousness, his life. Make sure you get that one. Christ has bought us back with his very life so that we can live by his life. 
Not by our life, which is a created life, which was finite and able to die. That's why we are all dying. No, he gave us his life. I pray we understand what that means, that Christ gave us his life. Christ giving us the life of Christ is not created because Christ is God. And so we're talking about the very uncreated life of God has been given to man so that he may live. We have been redeemed and given that life so that we may live. Did you get that? That we are, we, when the Bible talks about life eternal, it's talking about God's life. And that is the life that Jesus Christ has made provision of for you and for me. The very life of God, which can never be quenched, which can never end. It is a ceaseless, eternal condition of joy, peace, and happiness. The life of God. And that is a life that we can experience even now. I want to pause to make that very clear. And it may seep in our minds that when the Bible says, this is life eternal, to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, who thou hast sent, life eternal begins now in the knowledge of Christ as our righteousness. Right. So Christ is our righteousness. He actually became us. He became us by birth and he partook of the same as us. He actually had blood relations with us. He partook of flesh and blood like us all. And we're going to be looking into more of that significance. And one of the main, one of the the, the thrust of uh, of that fact that he became one of us and partook of flesh and blood is the fact that he was tempted like as we are. We saw that last study. That he was tempted like as we are. Yet, the Bible says, he was without sin. He was tempted like as we are. And he withstood all the temptations of the enemy as myself and as you, and he overcame. He uh, he undertook all the temptations that you ever dealt with and that I have ever dealt with and that the other man has ever dealt with. And he has overcome each and every single one of them. He warred against it and overcame it by the power of God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 8, in Matthew the 8th chapter and verse uh, 17. Because we need to be convinced that Christ is our righteousness. The, The power and the strength is for us. Because it was in us and as us that Christ has overcame. I'll say that again. Christ overcame as a man, as mankind, as us. And because he overcame as us, that means that he has given us the power. And so all of us who have our weaknesses, our infirmities, Christ is touched by our infirmities. We saw that in in the book of Hebrews chapter four. He is touched by our infirmities, our weaknesses. And here in Matthew chapter eight and verse 17, the Bible says this, because we need to see that Christ really is a savior nigh at hand. He is a savior that is close to us, closer than a brother. He knows what we're going through. He knows our weaknesses because he took it on. He took on our weaknesses. I was talking to a friend of mine, a good sister of mine, and she asked me the question, have you ever, you know, do you ever fall off and stuff like that? And look, we are all weak and the possibility is in all of us. So it's no, it's no, it's no, there's no good in finding out if other men, if other men fall off. What we need to know is Jesus and the fact that he has suffered what we're suffering. He has, he has, he, he felt the pressure that we feel because he took upon himself 
our nature, our humanity, our weaknesses. He took that upon himself. And in taking upon himself all those weaknesses and our bad equipment, he took that all upon himself and he overcame. There's no good. There's no, there's no strength. There's no um, joy that you can really receive from knowing that someone struggled with something that you struggled and they failed. Where's the joy in that? Where's the assurance of strength in that? There, there is none. Sometimes we, 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 we find joy in knowing, oh, oh, David was loved by God, but look at David. He, he did this and he, did, he failed and he, he fell and God, yes, it's wonderful to see that no, you could fall, but God still loves you and he's going to pick you back up. But what's even better is to know that there was one just like us who suffered everything that we suffered and he was pressed down even as we are pressed down, except he never sinned. He overcame. He's a winner. He is a winner. And we, like him, can be winners as well. We could learn from people's failures. But there's much to experience in the winning life of Jesus Christ. That is what we need to be looking at. Not so much the fact that people fell and lost and then they got back up. It's good. It's amazing to see people get back up. That is beautiful. That is beautiful to know that if I fall, I have a Savior who is near at hand to pick me up. But also what's beautiful is that when I stand up, when the enemy comes in again like a flood, the Bible says that God lifts up a standard against him and stops him from being able to bring me down. Because the Bible says in the book of Jude, now unto him who is able to keep me from falling. I want to experience that power of God. Because when I fall, that's my fault. That's because of me choosing to deny the power of God. But then God is so loving. God is so lo we 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 can never go too far or too deep or too low from God because he went to the second death to get us and every time we fall he's willing to pick us back up but brothers and sisters and him picking us back up what's beautiful is that he can keep us from falling that is the gospel that God is able to keep us from falling the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, to save us from sinning. And in Christ, God did just that. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took, speaking about Jesus, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. What did he take? Our infirmities. What else? Our sicknesses. Now, some of us don't believe that verse. Some of us don't believe that verse. The Bible says that he took our infirmities and he took our sicknesses. Now, somebody's saying, well, there's some people that are still sick right now. So what do you mean about that? Some people say, you know, I'm still falling into sin. So what do you mean about that? The Bible says that he took all of our infirmities and all of our sicknesses. Was Jesus ever sick? No, there's absolutely nowhere in the Bible that says Jesus was sick. Jesus was never sick. He took all of our infirmities, all of our weaknesses. The Bible says in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. Christ was filled with the strength and with the power of of God. And that is a privilege that you and I may all experience, may all have in our life. And so our life of sinning and confessing, sinning and confessing, sinning and confessing and looking at sickness, sickness it can be paralleled sometimes to sin as well. I said sometimes it can be paralleled to sin as well. Sickness is not necessary. Sinning is not necessary. No, not when Jesus is around. Those things are not necessary because Jesus is a savior nigh at hand. Jesus is a healer at every point of our life. We do not need that stuff. Does God allow sickness to come in our life? Sure he does. Sure he does. God allowed it for Paul. God allowed it for, allowed it for Sister White also. 
But now look for you now. A lot of us just are content and say, yeah, this is my lot in life. This is how God, where did you read that? Did God tell you that? My brothers and sisters, we need to wrestle with God. Remember Jacob? Jacob wrestled. He said, I will not let you go until I get my blessing. Now your blessing may be to keep that sickness for a certain period of time to build in you the character of God, patience, love, kindness, humility. But don't ever go around thinking God wants me to stay sick. God wants us to be healthy, brothers and sisters. The right hand, the right arm of the third angel's message is the health message. God's healing power to the sin-sick soul. God wants to heal you. God does not want us to remain sick. God does not want us to remain in sin. He allows those things to occur so that we can learn and so that we can grow. But he doesn't want us to stay in there, brothers and sisters. Don't ever for a moment think God wants me to stay sick. God wants me to stay this way, ruined, unfortunate. Not, don't go around ever thinking that. If God allows it, it's for a reason. But don't ever think that God wants me to stay like this in my life. God is a restorer. The song says, God restores. God restores, brothers and sisters. So I pray that we are encouraged to know that even as we can overcome sin by the grace of God in Christ because he took all of our sins, our sicknesses may be overcome as well because he took all of them upon himself and he was never sick, meaning that he has given us a message. Even as he's given us a message to overcome sin, he has given us a message to overcome sickness and also to prevent sickness by the grace of God. That's a whole other series on the ministry of healing and the third angel's message of righteousness by faith. But here we're looking at the fact that Christ took all of our weaknesses. He partook of flesh and blood. We established that. He became nearest of kin. He became blood relatives with you and with me. Christ is a blood relative of the human family, not of the angels and nor of the unfallen world. They don't know him like we can. Do you understand me? They don't know him like it is our privilege to know him. They, they don't. They, they don't. The unity that man has with God, angels do not and can never have. Because God in Christ has, has become one with humanity and given us overwhelming power to overcome sin and to overcome each and every single one of our tendencies to sin. Each and every single one of our what? of our tendencies to sin. Yes, even our tendencies. The Bible talks about temptation, and we spoke about that briefly in our last message, but we want to look at the definition according to the Bible, and that's found in the book of James chapter 1 and verse 14. We're looking at the fact that, that God can, has given us victory over even our tendencies in Jesus Christ because he actually became nearest of kin. He knows just what we're going through and he has overcome everything that we are going through, giving us the power to do the same. We're in James chapter 1 and verse 14 and the Bible defines temptation right there. Okay, the Bible says, but every man is tempted when he is what? When he is drawn away of his own lust and an Enticed. And so every so and so temptation is when we are drawn away by the lust of the flesh. When we are drawn away by our own self-will, our own selfish desires, our own natural inclinations. Okay, that is what temptation is. When we are drawn away to do our own will, our own way without consideration to God's will or God's way. Or even if we do consider it, we still have our own thing that we want to do, our own thing that we want to experience, our own thing that we want to live in life. And what we'll find is that every single drawing or tendency that was in us, it was in Adam. Every drawing or tendency that you find in any man in this entire universe, it was all in Adam. The tendency and the want to to, to, to kill, that was an Adam. 
it wasn't manifest in Adam, but it was manifest in people later on down in his uh, in his line in his uh, of his seed. That tendency uh, of homosexuality, it was in Adam also. It wasn't manifest in Adam, but but it was manifested in those later on that came from the line of Adam, wasn't it? All the tendencies of the flesh, all the sinful tendencies of the flesh, it was all in Adam. The tendency to naturally want to lash out at people who, who respond to you in a disrespectful manner. It was all in Adam because of that one sin. The tendency to just be rebellious. It was in Adam after that one sin. All our evil tendencies, all the tendencies of the flesh to do wickedly. It was all in Adam. And though it didn't all appear or manifest itself in him, it did in those that came from him. And when we study Christ, when we study who? When we study Christ, you know, God wasn't ashamed to let us know of Christ's ancestry. When we study him, the Bible shows us that all those tendencies that were in Adam and that were in Abraham and that were in David were in the human nature that Jesus Christ took on. I'm going to say that again. All those sinful tendencies that are in the human nature, that are in the human flesh, that were in Adam, that were in Abraham, Abraham and that were in David. And I'm pointing out those three individuals because the Bible clearly shows that Christ came from Adam, that Christ was in the line of Abraham. We saw that in Hebrews uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 16. And and he was also of the line of David. We saw that in Romans chapter eight and ver chapter one rather and verse three. He was in the line of David as well. We saw in Romans eight and verse three that he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. And so all sin that are in the flesh, that is the flesh that Jesus Christ took upon himself sinful flesh with all those tendencies. All of them. Each and every single one of them. Now let me ask you a question to make sure that you comprehend what we are stating by the grace of God. Where were all those tendencies? In the fallen human flesh. They were in the sinful human nature. Where were they again? They were in the fallen human nature. Now, what nature did Jesus Christ take upon himself? Christ took upon himself the fallen human sinful nature. That is the one that he clothed his sinless divinity with. And we express that like that, that it may be clear to us that we see how much of God's power we're talking about. We're talking about a power that dealt with the pressure of every sinful tendency of the human nature and the power of God overcame it. We read that already in the book of Romans chapter 8. And we're going to go back to there by the grace of God. And we're going to see how the power of God overcame it. And so it is none of our business what the tendency of an individual is. It is none of our business what the sinfulness of an individual is. It, that's not of our concern. Our priority is the gospel which is the power of God to overcome 
that tendency that that person has, whether or not they're, whether they're an alcoholic, whether they're a homosexual, whether they are a, a, a cheater, a liar, a stealer, a murderer, that doesn't matter because the gospel is the power of God to change that sinner into a saint. Do you get that, brothers and sisters? The power of God was demonstrated in Christ who took on that sinful human nature and overcame each and every single one of those temptations and each and every single one of those tendencies. The Bible says that he was tempted at all points, like as we are, yet without sin. Yet without sin. Now, some of us may have stronger tendencies than others, right? You may have a stronger tendency in one thing than I have. I may have a stronger tendency in another thing that you don't have. Well, Christ dealt with all our tendencies and he overcame them all. He overcame them all. And so that is why we need to look at Christ as our personal savior from our sins. So when we say, Christ is my savior. Christ is my righteousness. What that means is that Christ knows what I'm going through. Christ felt it and he overcame it by the power of God. And that power of God is sufficient for me to overcome my issue, my problem, my weakness, my infirmity, because he was touched by my infirmity. He was touched by my weakness and he overcame he overcame, he overcame, and thank God that I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And the Bible says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. The life that Christ had was a righteous life. And so if the life of the flesh is in the blood, when we're covered with the blood of Jesus, Better yet, when the blood of Jesus is pumping through our veins and his life is our life, then we overcome sin. We overcome every single one of our tendencies by the grace and by the power of God in Christ. That is the power of the gospel to change a sinner into a saint. That is what Christ can do for you. That is what Christ has has done for you? Are you allowing it to be a living reality in you? Christ was able to get that done, brothers and sisters, because he actually became us. There's a wonderful law called the law of heredity. And the law of heredity means that you inherit certain traits and characteristics from your parents. Now, you may not have the exact traits or characteristics from your parents, but maybe from your grandparents or even from your great, great grandparents. You inherit some of their traits. You inherit some of their tendencies. You inherit that. You inherit that. It's a law called uh, the law of like produces like. The law of like produces a like. An apple seed always produces an apple tree, okay? So is the law of like produces like the tendencies are just built in over time to the next and to the next generation in the book of Exodus chapter 34 and verse 7. The Bible says in the second part of it, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation, meaning that the, the iniquitous tendencies, the sinful tendencies that was from generation to generation and goes on to the third, even to the fourth generation. The tendencies continue to go on over time. And that is the law and that is how it works. And it is a good law. It is a good law. It works all the time. Now it's work may feel good or it may feel bad. It may feel good or it may feel bad. When man, it was created good. If man continued in that way of goodness, then that man would, would, would continue to grow and develop in goodness. Think about, let's give an example of gravity, the law of gravity. The law of gravity is always working, and once you understand it, then you know to put one foot before you and the next foot after that, and you start walking, and hey, the law of gravity is good stuff. 
it works because you're running or you're doing whatever you're doing. When you're when someone is building some something, they consider the law of gravity how it works. So they build it a certain way or, or whatever, right? Gravity, the law of gravity is always at work. And it feels good when you're walking properly, when you're running, it, it feels good when you when you are cooperating with that law, right? But now say if you're on top of a cliff and you fall down, the law of gravity is still at work and it doesn't feel good. And that's exactly what happened to man after man sinned. After man sinned, they continued to progress, except they were progressing in something that was not good. They were progressing in weakness and in degradation because of sin. But if only they did right, they would have progressed in the glory of God, in their purpose. As a matter of fact, in the book Education, in this wonderful, excellent book that every, every, everyone should read it, especially students, this is a book that you must read, that you must read. There's a, uh, on page 15, on page 15 in this book, it says this about if man had continued abiding by that good law. Had he remained loyal to God, all this would have been his forever, meaning all the world. Throughout eternal ages, he would have continued to gain new treasures of knowledge, to discover fresh springs of happiness, and to obtain clearer and yet clearer conceptions of the wisdom, the power, and the love of God. More and more fully would he have fulfilled the object of his creation. More. So there's a progression, a development, a growth. More and more fully would he have reflected the creator's glory. More and more fully would he have reflected the creator's glory if he continued growing and progressing in truth and in obedience to the law of God. But man sinned, and in man sinning, man inherited, not inherited, but man uh, received, man now had the sinful flesh, and all his desires were no good. Before that, his desires were good, and they were, they were, they were good, right? But now after sinning, his desires were always evil, were always no good. They were selfish. They were against God. They were for self. And we already saw that self is an issue. Self is a problem that must be handled, right? The flesh and that law that was in our nature, that was in our human flesh or human nature, that law of selfishness, of, 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 of seeking for self, right? The law of heredity, it, it continued working. And every other man inherited that sinful human nature, that nature that was always seeking after self, that nature that, 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 that was living against the will of God, that human nature. And man became weak because of sin, and his flesh and his nature became weak because of sin, and that weak flesh, that weak nature, reached even Jesus Christ. Now, I want us to remember this and, 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 and continue to pay very careful attention. That it is not in him that the weakness was. The weakness was not in him. The weakness was in the flesh that he took on. Do you get that? The weakness was not in Christ. The weakness was in the flesh that he took on, which was our flesh, our natural desires. It pulled and it sought to entice him. It sought to entice him to do his own will. It sought to get him to turn those stones into bread. What's wrong with turning stones into bread? You got to eat. But was it the father's, father's will that he turns those stones into bread? No. And so in his flesh, 
which was our flesh. So in the flesh that he took on was the pull to turn those stones into bread. But the power of God was working in him because he had a mind, which is called the divine mind. And we're going to have a whole entire lesson on that. He had the divine mind, which was the mind that was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was not the carnal mind because the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can it be, but he had the divine mind, which was completely submitted to the father and to the father's will and never his own. And in being completely submitted to the father's will, brothers and sisters, you know, the father doesn't play games with the flesh. The Father made the flesh subservient. The Father made the sinful human flesh that was pulling and tugging after our Savior to sin. He made that sinful flesh subservient to the mind of Christ. To the mind which he has brought to mankind in order to overcome sin. Oh, brothers and sisters, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get into that so thoroughly. The mind of Jesus Christ, which is that mind that made the sinful flesh obey. Remember how in Romans chapter eight and verse three, how the Bible says, matter of fact, we could turn there in Romans chapter eight and verse three, Romans, the eighth chapter and the third verse, the Bible says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, he condemned sin in the flesh. He didn't condone sin in the flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh. He made the flesh submit to the mind. The mind of Christ, which was the mind that was filled with the spirit of God that, that did what the law could not do for the flesh. It made the flesh submit to the law of God. The mind of Christ. The mind of Jesus Christ. So though he had all our tendencies in his flesh, because he had our flesh. Let me make it really clear why we continue to say that he took upon himself our flesh. There are a lot of sloppy ways to say that, oh, Christ had our flesh. Christ, Christ, uh, rather, Christ had a sinful flesh because some may leave with the thought that, oh, see, Christ, Christ sometimes he wanted to sin. Christ sometimes he wanted to sin. That is not so. Christ never wanted to do evil. The Bible says so in the book of Psalms chapter 40 and verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Always within my heart. Christ delighted in the ways of God. Christ never, Romans chapter 15. Uh, Romans chapter 15, you're going to see something. I think we mentioned it in our last message. Romans 15 and verse 3. For even Christ pleased not himself. Wow. Did Christ ever please himself? Never. Hmm. Let that one sink in. Did Christ ever please himself? Never. Christ never pleased self. Christ always kept self surrendered. Not by his might. Not by anything, but by his faith. By his faith in the Father. In the book of John, chapter 5, and verse 30, Jesus said, I can of mine own self do nothing. Sort of like you. In John 15, Jesus said, 
Without me, you can do nothing. Christ said, I can of mine own self do nothing. And in John chapter 14 and verse 10, Jesus said, it is the Father that does the works in me. Do we see how entirely Christ became ourselves? That is the leading thought, that Christ so became us to be our example, to show us he never pleased himself. He always submitted to the Father so that the Father's pleasure could be done in him. And you know what the Father's pleasure was? The Father's pleasure was to keep the sinful flesh subservient to his righteousness. And so it was by faith in the Father that Christ condemned sin that was in our flesh. That was in our flesh. So, I, so that is why we say that he took on our flesh so that we can see that it was ours that he took on. It was ours that he warred against. It was in ours that he had faith in his father and that his father destroyed, slew, overcame the sinfulness of our flesh. So though those tendencies in his flesh, though he had those tendencies in his flesh because it was our flesh, he put them all underfoot by receiving strength from his Father at all times. Now, many of the tendencies in us have appeared in, op in open action. So we see that Christ has overcome every single tendency. Whenever the flesh is like, do this evil thing, Christ overcame that by the power of the Spirit of God. He overcame every single tendency, but some may be wondering, okay, he overcame the tendencies. But what about the actions that I did? I actually sinned. I actually did this. And because I did it, now I want to do it even more. I drank, and now I'm an alcoholic. I want to keep on drinking. I cultivated this thing. I cultivated this habit of doing that. Christ never sinned. And so how can he be a helper to me? Christ never sinned. Christ never cultivated a tendency. My brother and my sister, I got good news. Christ is a complete Savior. Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. Rather, Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6. You want to write that down and keep that for yourself. If you're thinking to yourself, I have this tendency that I cultivated. I have this habit that I cultivated. That's not a problem to God. You see... Some of us are panicking about some things that we've done. God is panic proof. He done took care of the problem a long time ago in Christ. So we need to have faith. We need to trust that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power which works in us. If the power of God, which is the gospel, works in us, then God's going to get it done. So Christ Christ, Christ. How does Christ take care of those tendencies of those things that we did in open action? All right. In Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 3, the Bible says, the Bible, 53, I'm saying, 53 and verse 6, rather, 53 and verse 6, the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of of us who? Of us all. All of your iniquity was laid on Christ. What is iniquity? Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 12. In the book of Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 12, the Bible explains what iniquity is. And the Bible says, For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities... We know them. So our iniquities are known sins. Our iniquities are what? Our iniquities are known sins. And all of our iniquities was laid on Christ. 
all of them, each and every single one of them. There's not one missing. All of our iniquities was laid on Christ. So my brother, my sister, I do not care what your sin is. Neither does God. And even if I did care, it still wouldn't matter. But they were all laid on Jesus Christ. First Peter, first Peter chapter two and verse 24. I got another text for you out of mouth of two or three witnesses. First Peter chapter two, first Peter chapter two. We're going to take a look at verse 24. First Peter chapter two and verse 24. Let's see what the gospel has to say there for us. First Peter chapter two and verse 24. The Bible says there, who in his own self bear our what? Bear our sins, bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Christ is our righteousness. Jesus is my righteousness and he is your righteousness and he is the righteousness of the other man. And this contemplates the entire human family. He is our righteousness because he took all of our sins. It was all laid on him and he overcame all of our sins. He overcame not just our sins, but even our tendencies to sin, Christ overcame each and every single one of them so that when we realize his love and having taken all of our sins upon us, upon himself, then we also realize by the grace of God that he even has given us power over the tendencies, over the pull of the flesh. And while the pull of the flesh may still be there, while the tug may still be there, Christ has given us sufficient power, sufficient of his love, sufficient of his grace. The Bible says that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The grace of God in Christ will give us the power and the victory even over the tendencies that are in us to sin. That is all in him. Never forget that expression, that it is in him that it is found in Jesus Christ our savior, our redeemer, our restorer, our joy, our everything. It is in Christ that it is found. We are complete in him. I want to read to you a statement from Desire of Ages, which, which really in such a beautiful way makes the statement so clear that by the power of the spirit of God dwelling in us, we will have victory over every single tendency that is in us because Christ had the victory in those tendencies because he was nearest of kin. He was one of us. He had blood relations with us in order to redeem us from the curse of the law, in order to redeem us from sin, in order to take us out and give us victory over even the tendencies to sin. So again, though we may feel the tendency, we may have victory over the tendency whereby those tendencies will never have the ability to express themselves in us because they never were ever allowed to express themselves in Christ. Why? Because he always had his mind on the father. Desire of Ages, page 671. And Desire of Ages, page 671. Desire of Ages. Paragraph 2, it says, It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. Amen. It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the... I'll read that sentence again. It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. So Christ has given you and Christ has given me all 
power, all power by his spirit to overcome every single hereditary and every single cultivated, meaning those tendencies that we work towards. So the hereditary tendencies that we have, we, we, we didn't do anything to have them. We were just born and we had them. We didn't do anything to have them. We're just as responsible for the sun rising and shining as we are for the hereditary tendencies that we have. We're just as responsible for the sun shining and for the dog barking. Okay? For the hereditary tendencies that we have. We just have them because we were born of a certain people. But as far as for the cultivated tendencies, we did those things. We, we, we worked at those things. But the Bible says that Christ took all our iniquities. And we just read from this beautiful, most inspired book that, that, that Christ, by the power of the Spirit, has given us all victory over hereditary and cultivated tendencies to sin. Oh, brothers and sisters, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that in him we may be new creatures. Christ actually, seriously, became one of us. He knows just what we're going through. He knows the heart ache that you're dealing with, brother and sister. He knows how the guilt feels. He knows how the condemnation feels. I was going to pose the question, if Christ felt the guilt of sin, though he didn't sin, did he feel the guilt of sin? If anyone, or one, if anyone of us think to ourselves, nah, he didn't exactly feel the guilt of sin. He never sinned. That's true, he never sinned. But think about it this way. Think of the man who is a sinner. He never did one particle of righteousness. But he saw the love of God in Christ on the cross of Calvary. And he accepted the sacrifice of Christ for himself. He accepted what... Christ did. He accepted Christ as a savior for him. And God realizes that and God puts in or God inputs or that word that we may often hear when studying righteousness by faith. God imputes the righteousness of Christ in that man. Does that man feel the righteousness of Christ? That man who never did one particle of sin, he actually feels a change. A wonderful change that comes over him. A change that restores his mind. A change that restores his thoughts. That change is called conversion. That feeling is the feeling of the indwelling of Christ. That feeling is the feeling of the work of the Holy Spirit in his heart. He feels that the burden or that the condemnation is lifted off. So even if that, as that man who has never committed, who has never done one particle of righteousness, feels differently, not just physically feels, but spiritually Christ felt it also. Christ felt our guilt because the iniquity of us all was laid on him. Take a second, brother, sister. Just take a second right now just to think of, of the worst thing in the universe that you ever did. Just the one worst thing that you ever did. And think of how guilty you felt because of that one thing that you did. All right, now forget it. Now forget it. I didn't mean to open up any old wounds. Now forget that and remember every evil thing that you've ever done. And think of how that guilt would feel if all that guilt was in you at, in, in, in one moment. All of that guilt 
all that feeling of condemnation was on Christ. The iniquity of us all was laid on him. Now, don't just put your guilt, but put all of your friend's guilt. Matter of fact, put every man's guilt that's alive on this world. You know, not just those that are living, but also those that are dead. Because there are more dead people than living people in this world right now. Take all the guilt of every single living man. Place it on Christ. That's how our Savior felt in the Garden of Gethsemane. He felt crushed down, persecuted. He felt our guilt. He felt all of our condemnation because he became one of us. He was one of us. And he took all of our sins upon himself. But the good news is that though he died, he resurrected. He overcame it all. He took our guilt from off of us, put it on himself, and removed it. He has slain the enmity for you, brothers and sisters. He has slain it for me. Jesus removed the condemnation for us all. That's why the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 8, that there is now therefore no condemnation for those that are in, where? In Christ Jesus, walking not after the flesh, not after seeking to please self, but walking after the Spirit, the Spirit of God. Ah, oh, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself not imputing their sins unto them. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19, not imputing our sins to us, he imputed our sins to his son Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness, who is our redeemer, our restorer, our everything. When we say that Christ is our everything, he is seriously, brothers and sisters, he is our everything. Do you get it? Jesus is all the world to us. He is everything to us because he did everything to us. Oh, brothers and sisters, it gets even sweeter. But we're going to close here by the grace of God and we'll continue in our next message. In our next message, we're going to be looking into the two Adams. Still looking more into the fact that Christ took on himself our all, all of our condemnation, our guilt. He took it all upon himself. And I want to leave you with one verse, brothers and sisters. I want to leave you with one verse, and, we're, we're, and, we, and we'll shut down here by the grace of God. And that verse is in the book of Romans. And you got to turn there for yourself, because if you don't, then the promise is maybe not, is just not for you. But you got to look at it for yourself in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. And then we'll close here. Romans, the sixth chapter, and verse 14. And this, brothers and sisters, is for you. Now, I don't know you, but I know who created you. And he made this promise for you. And he made it for me, too. What does it say there in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14? The Bible says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, meaning under the curse, but you are under grace. Thank God for that grace, that grace that will pardon and cleanse within, that grace that is greater than all our sins. Because of that grace, sin shall not have dominion over you. Your hereditary and cultivated tendencies 
will not have dominion over you. Now we are free in Christ who has brought us that grace that delivers us from the bondage of sin. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, including you, including me, including all your neighbors who need to hear this good news, that the grace of God that unmerited favor is not just a second chance, but it is the power of the Spirit of God. To bring them under the reign of grace, under the reign of God, so that sin will no longer have dominion over them. It no longer needs to be that way. Because in Christ, who has become one of us, who has became the nearest of kin, who has become blood relatives with us, who knows and has felt the pressure of our tendencies, the pressure of our flesh because he took our flesh. He has overcome them all. All of our iniquities was laid on him and he overcame them all. He condemned sin in the flesh and will give you power to condemn it also. Only in Christ. For if any man be in Christ Jesus, then he is a new creation. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Old hereditary and cultivated tendencies are passed away. And all things, all things are made new. Look to Jesus. And by beholding him, you will be changed. Take a fresh look at the cross of Calvary again. And look at how our Savior, who took all of our iniquities, died and was resurrected and overcame them all. He overcame even death. So he can overcome your sins in your heart. Look at him on Calvary. Just look at him. And if you've looked at him this morning and this afternoon and just a few minutes ago, look at him again. Look at him. Overcoming our sin. Look at him. Who was reviled and he reviled not. Look at him. Revealing God's character under the greatest test and under the greatest pressure. Look at him. Who revealed God's glory even in the worst time of his life. Look at him dying for you, for your sins, and condemning your sins so that you would no longer be under its dominion. Look at him. Look at Christ, our Redeemer, and our righteousness. Look at him who sanctified us the sanctifier, who has become one with us, the sanctified. God bless. Father, we want to thank you for Jesus. We thank you that your word has let us know that he that sanctifies and they that are sanctified are all of one. Jesus became nearest of kin to us. He became blood relatives with us so that we and overcome sin and more than just overcoming sin so that we can be one with you partakers of the divine nature have a relation a union with you that no other creature can experience we thank you lord for jesus who is our righteousness our lord and personal savior from all our hereditary 
and cultivated tendencies, our personal Savior, from those things. Oh, Father, teach us to continue to look at Christ as our personal Savior. We thank you for what Jesus has done for us. We thank you for the work that he wants to complete in us and make a living reality in our life. Lord, we ask for the faith of Christ so that we like him may be patient, saints. So that we like him may keep your commandments, your righteous law by the faith of your son Christ. Oh Lord, cleanse us, we pray. Cleanse us, we pray. And that Christ may be continually lifted up in our hearts. In his name we pray, Father. Thank you for Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Brother, sister, accept Jesus as your Lord and as your personal Savior from your hereditary and cultivated tendency. God bless you.